All right. Good morning, Four Oaks Church. It's Pastor Paul. It is Monday morning. Let's see here, February 21st. So glad that you've joined us. For those who came to our Theology and Practice uh, seminar with Dr. Greg Allison um, on Saturday, what an awesome, incredible time that was. And we thought we would take these opportunities this week, now that we've kind of got Greg captive here with us, um, to continue those discussions from Saturday. So this is sort of taking the place of our regular pastoral devotionals um, that we've been doing through the Book of Romans. But believe me, I think this will be far better um, experience. And so, first of all, Greg, thanks for being here with us. Thanks for inviting me, Paul. It's and a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. I mean, there were so many questions, Great. so many um, things that people were asking, wanted to follow up. Obviously, we didn't have time to cover it all yep. um, on Saturday. So I thought we would use these mornings to this week just to, to kind of come behind and pick up some of those questions. Glad to do it. All yeah. right. Well, I'm just gonna go, so Four Oaks Church, I'm gonna fire away here. And um, these are sort of a synthesis of different questions that you have submitted, along with some things that I've sort of tossed in here a, as well. Greg, you've obviously been speaking about Roman Catholicism, and I thought you did an incredibly fair job of representing what Protestantism teaches, what Roman Catholicism teaches, without it being a real attack. And I thought think that was super well received. Thanks, yeah. Um, but maybe for some who aren't as familiar historically with how Protestantism came into being or split off from the Roman Catholic Church, um, maybe just kind of give us just like a brief historical primer on that. And if we, Obviously, as you told me before we started taping, this could that's, that's a long question, okay? In fact, we're doing a whole tour about this this summer in Germany. <laughs> go on um, a tour. <laughs> that, go, go on a tour. Now, you, there's a little, a little little blurb. <laughs> little blurb, that's right. So um, maybe just kind of help us get a little context for um, what set the stage for the Reformation and what were the, what were the breaking points and what, what, what sort of ignited the fire, so to speak. 1517... Uh, October 31st, 1517, would really mark the beginning of the Reformation. This is when Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church, calling for a debate about Roman Catholicism and his view of it. That was obviously preceded by centuries of development that led to that radical step, including the captivity of the Roman papacy in France, the city of Avignon, for 70 years, the papacy uh, was moved from Rome to Avignon, France. The popes became basically puppets of the French uh, leadership, the French government. There was tremendous corruption, a lot of immorality. The popes were living luxurious, very wealthy lives, uh, uh, just a disaster. Yeah, uh, That was followed by this reality in which there were two popes, one in Avignon, one in Rome, that eventually led to three popes, one in Avignon, one in Rome, and then one that was proclaimed to be the pope by a council. So we have uh, the Roman Catholic Church divided between two popes, three popes, that's a disaster. Mm -hmm. There's spiritual bankruptcy, there's moral bankruptcy, and so the situation is rife right for a revolution, or in this case, a reformation. And, and so those are some of the conditions yeah. that led to what Martin Luther did on October 31st, 1517. Well, maybe we can just talk about that for a second, um, or, or longer, but you talked about, you know, Luther nailed his 95 theses. This was an invitation to a debate about mm -hmm. indulgences. Yep. So m might be helpful, what are indulgences? And how do they fit into the Roman Catholic system of theology and worldview? An indulgence is a remission of sins. So for those who are uh, die in the grace of God and in the friendship of God, but who are not completely purified, their souls don't go to heaven, they don't go to hell, but they go to purgatory, where they must experience purification or purgation of the taint of sin. An indulgence is a remission of sin, that temporal punishment that people, the souls of people would experience in purgatory. And so an indulgence is something that one could purchase, uh, something that one could earn by going on pilgrimages, 
uh, being involved, fighting as a soldier in a crusade. There are different ways that you can obtain these remissions of sins, yes, for yourself, but primarily for the souls of beloved people, uh, relatives, friends in purgatory. And so it's a way to uh, get them uh, either a lesser time in purgatory or get them out of purgatory uh, completely. So uh, this was the background that really challenged Luther and that he challenged in uh, that debate, those debate points. Now, the, you talked about the punishment for sin. You talked to us Saturday about mortal sins, venial sins. What, what sins are we talking about here? Are we talking about venial sins that people died not having paid penance for? Or how does that, what does that work look like? So venial sins mm. don't need the sacrament of penance, okay. but but they do put a stain on your soul, okay. so that you're not pure. Right. A mortal sin, uh, any mortal sin, which is premeditated, full consent, mm -hmm. full awareness that yep. this is a heinous sin, yep. breaking one of the Ten Commandments or more of the Ten Commandments, mortal sin uh, results in the loss of grace. Okay. So any uh, any person who would die in mortal sin. Uh, not having availed herself of the sacrament of penance, uh, if she would die, her soul would go immediately to hell. Okay. No chance of purgatory. Okay. So purgatory is not a place for people who die with mortal sin, okay. but who die with venial sin, the taint of that, and still the taint of mortal sin that still needs to be purged. The The penalty has been paid, the punishment is, in a sense has been paid, but there's still this taint, this mark on a person's uh, soul that, that has to be purged. And so they would go to purgatory uh, for this uh, cleansing. So you talked about some of the corruption that was happening. It seems that if the Roman Catholic Church is exchanging um, indulgences for pardon or remission of the punishment for sin, mm -hmm. and oftentimes indulgences were actually purchased with money, Yes, they were. It would, yeah. it would seem that that would set up um, an opportunity where more devious minds and motives could use that as leverage in people's lives. Absolutely. It's, it's a huge matter of power. Uh, so in Luther's context in Germany, there's a, a famous indulgence seller by the name of Johann Tetzler, mm -hmm. Tetzel. Uh, and, and, the, and the kind of idea was, uh, rather than going to Mass being a serious Catholic, uh, trying to engage in good works, you could purchase these indulgences for yourself or for the souls of people in purgatory. So there was this corrupting influence of these indulgences. You wouldn't have to be a good Catholic. You just had to have money and pay for these things. And this disturbed Luther very strongly because this is counter to the gospel. It's counter to Jesus' call to repentance which is not go through this sacrament of penance, but it's a complete change of your heart and your life, but an indulgence, in a sense, allowed you who are living to uh, avoid a serious commitment to Christ, to mm. the gospel, to repentance, and then you could buy your way out of heaven, or uh, sorry, your way out of purgatory, or buy the uh, way out of uh, purgatory for those souls of your loved ones in purgatory, so uh, it, it became a corrupting influence, replacing genuine Christian faith, repentance, uh, for this uh, monetary exchange of remission of sins. So what caused this particular debate that Luther proposed? It clearly caught fire with the people in a way maybe previous movements or previous attempts at reform had not. So what were, what were some of those key ingredients, um, so to speak. For Luther, uh, who was a lecturer in sacred scripture, he was preaching through Romans, Yes, very important, yep. and Galatians, and Romans, mm -hmm. and Galatians, and other places. Mm -hmm. And he was struck by this doctrine, biblical teaching on justification by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And whereas he once considered God to be this tyrannical, a uh, wrathful God, uh, whom he could, whom he Luther mm -hmm. could never please, as he understood the gospel and God's work of justification, declaring us not guilty but righteous instead, he his, his whole view of God changed. Mm -hmm. He could see God now, yes, as a 
righteous and just and wrathful God against sinners, but then he could see this God as forgiving sinners, declaring them not guilty, imputing to them the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that their standing before God was complete in Christ. This revolutionized his view of God, the Christian life, the call to repentance. Uh, it is not a matter of penance. It's not a matter of buying indulgences. It's a matter of turning your whole life away from sin, orienting it by faith to Jesus Christ. And, and that yeah. sparked, that was another element sparking mm -hmm. the Reformation. Yeah, it seems that Luther saw to its logical conclusion, if this, if this sacramental system was true, or the, the, indul the purchase of indulgences, there, how could there really be ultimate assurance outside of, I mean, there's no contrition that's needed. It, exactly. It's just a big pocketbook, so to speak. In a, sense, it, in a sense, it emptied the cross of its power because that was replaced by indulgences that could then buy people's way out of purgatory. And so it voided the cross of Christ, which, of course, he was driven to by his study of Romans and Galatians and the rest of Scripture. Great. So one of the things that you talked about um, on Saturday is that the three-legged stool mm -hmm. of the magisterium, tradition, and scripture. And clearly, Luther and the Reformers were calling for a principle of sola scriptura. And um, that seemed to... Was that the crucial split? In other words, was, was the crucial split over authority um, and the authority of scripture versus tradition, or was the split over justification, what would you say was like the, the heartbeat of the division? Yes, both of those. Okay. okay. So we call a sola scriptura the formal principle of Protestantism. That is, if we would describe the framework, the structure that launched Protestantism, it was this consideration, the ultimate authority uh, for our life, our practice, as Christians is scripture and scripture alone, not tradition, not the magisterium. So that's one of two principles of Protestantism, uh, sola scriptura, the formal principle. The material principle, if we had to boil down the Reformation mm. to one critical doctrine, the material principle is that of justification by God's grace alone, appropriated through faith alone, in Christ alone, mm -hmm. for the glory of God alone. Okay. Well... There's a, there's a couple of questions that people have that relate to the development of Protestantism after the Reformation, yep. and we are going to dive into those tomorrow again when we're together. So, Four Oaks, thanks for joining us. Um, as you can tell, we're in for a treat this week. Um, I'm just soaking all this in, um, and I'm sure that you are doing the same. So we will be back here tomorrow, Tuesday morning, to continue this conversation.